1990, this Ugandan army invades Rwanda. The leader of the Ugandan, or the Ugandan slash RPF army is led by Paul Kagame, who was at Fort Leavenworth at the time the invasion took place. He comes back from Fort Leavenworth to take uh, control of the army. Uh, the invasion fails, 2,500 troops withdraw, go to the mountains. Two years later, the same army comes back. It's now grown from 2,500 human <coughs> troops to more than 20,000 really well-trained, well-armed troops. They've become the most uh, uh, dominant military force in the country. Query, how does a military force between 91 and 93, after the Soviet Union has collapsed, become a major military force in the middle of Africa on their own? Uh, it's probably not likely. Who is it that is capable of doing that in the world? The answer, of course, is the uh, uh, country that, the, uh, unfortunately, we know all too well. Uh, the uh, assault in February of 93 almost takes over the country. Uh, a sixth of the population is displaced. The country is, uh, is destabilized. Um, they attempt to enter into a power sharing agreement. That's going to require the militarily dominant force to give up their militarily dominant position, become a minority political force. And then, next door in Burundi, there's an election. For the first time, a president, a group of president from the 85% Hutu majority is elected in July. The US and UK pressured the United Nations to remove French and Belgian troops who stopped the original assault earlier that year, when I had mentioned to you. Uh, by uh, December, October of 93, Burundi explodes because the president is assassinated in Burundi. 100,000 people are killed. A third of a million people, half a million people uh, uh, flood into Rwanda. And the US ambassador, the US ambassador tells Kagame, the leader of the RPF forces, if you start the war again, you are going to be responsible for violence in Rwanda, just like happened in Burundi, not because there's a long planned genocide, but because those are the conditions that exist in this area. Because the president was assassinated next door, everything is on the tender hooks, and you are the militarily dominant force in this country. If you start the war, that is going to happen. Then what happens, of course, is the presidents of the two countries are assassinated. You've heard about the missiles that are taking down the uh, presidents. After the, uh, the assassination, the country blows up in violence. Uh, there's uh, uh, the, what's called the Rwanda genocide. It goes on for 100 days. What the UN documents show is that the side that had militarily national military dominance refused to use its power to stop the uh, killings. The side that was militarily inferior asked the militarily dominant side to enter into a ceasefire repeatedly over 90 days. We have the documents that say that and that show that. Uh, and we have been able to document precisely what happened each day during the war to show that the mystery that you heard of the Rwandan genocide where everyone went crazy is in fact a war in which civilians were killed in a way that was reflective of the conditions that existed at the time used by the side that won the war in a way that was to their military advantage and that after they won the war, they told the story about the war in a way that benefited them. Now, what happened after this was quite interesting. The U.S. Army, or the Marines actually, uh, uh, found their way into Rwanda on July 19th, which was the same day that the RPF uh, declared military victory. Also, the State Department sent in a human rights investigator on the same day in July and August. That human rights investigator, Robert Gerstein, uh, did a, uh, a sweep in the area controlled by the guys who won the war. He found that the guys who won the war were committing massive crimes, killing people wholesale. He reported that to Kofi Annan. He reported that to Warren Christopher. We have the memos reporting that to both from September of 1994. 
from September of 1994 to today, the crimes of the RPF have been covered up by the UN, by the State Department, by the ICPR, and it was those documents that I put into evidence at the ICTR, at the tribunal, because I was able to use the disclosure principles at the ICTR to get into the UN files, to be able to get those documents, to be able to show what actually happened in Rwanda. The way that happened was a little interesting. Uh, this is what the clients were charged with in the tribunal. The indictment said that Bagasara, who was the main guy, this was the Milosevic guy and his four defendants, uh, were on trial for being a group of senior Hutu officers who for several years planned a systematic extermination of the Tutsis and other Hutus to secure the Hutu extremists' political dominance in the country. But the other thing that you haven't heard is that the guys who won the war have been indicted by a French judge and a Spanish judge for assassinating the previous president and the Burundian president and for committing genocide and war crimes, and they've been indicted to two countries. In addition to that, in August of this past year, after I was uh, released, uh, the UN itself issued a 600-page report explaining how between the years of 1993 and 2003, the side that won the war had been committing genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity in the Congo, right across the border from Rwanda. Uh, at the same time, they were supposedly the heroes of Rwanda stopping the genocide in Rwanda. In reality, what's beginning to happen is that the story of Central Africa is being rewritten. And there's an important connection with U.S. policy that I want to talk about that actually relates, I think, Judge Keith, to uh, the future of rulings like yours in the U.S. versus U.S. District Court. It seems a sort of odd connection, but I'm going to get there, I hope. Uh, yes. This is what was decided by the U.N. Tribunal. Uh, the Chamber said it's not satisfied after seven years of evidence that the prosecution has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the four accused conspired among themselves or with others to commit genocide in February 2009. Now, of course, you haven't heard that this happened. But the reality is that the evidence, the best evidence that the Rwanda government could produce, the State Department could produce, that the Justice Department could produce, um, does not support the story that you've heard that we all heard about what happened in Rwanda. Now the question is, why would that be? The, uh, uh, go back this the, the top four military officers are acquitted of these crimes. So the question is, if there was no planning and there was no conspiracy, what was it? Perhaps crimes of a certain sort. But the question was, then, is it really correct to call it a genocide? Mass crimes happened, that's certainly true. Mass killings occurred, that's certainly true. No one can deny that. The circumstances under which they occurred are very different than the circumstances that you have heard. So now we get into the story about the chief prosecutor. This is what the chief prosecutor has said in her memoir. It's unfair that politics undermines our work. I found it wounding to see that we have managed to ridicule the principles of international justice. But because the county has signed a bilateral agreement with the United States, and this essentially describes the circumstance I mentioned to you earlier, that she was called to the State Department, instructed what she should do, uh, not investigate the side that won the war. The result of that, of course, is that the side that won the war has not been prosecuted despite uh, the evidence of the contrary. Now, the reason that's important to me, of course, is that the result of that is that when I went to Rwanda to defend the interests of the presidential candidate, Victoria Ngabiri, who was interested in running against the current president of Rwanda, uh, I was detained. Um, and uh, it was only this international movement, spearheaded by the Lawyers Guild, the intervention of the State Department, the ABA, 
lawyers groups all over the world that put enough pressure on the one government to get me out. I'm lucky I'm alive. I found out from a uh, former uh, member of the Rwandan government who's in asylum now that last week a, uh, an alive or dead order was issued for my, uh, uh, my hide uh, from uh, President Kagame last week because he views me as being the single uh, greatest threat to the Rwandan government that exists because I do have the evidence uh, of the crimes that the Rwandan government has uh, committed. 